Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Brian Brew, and today we're talking about the Exodus, specifically the Exodus as co-opted improperly in liberation theology and as understood correctly as gospel history, that is, an event in redemptive history that foreshadows the gospel, as well as images it in different ways. So, Greg, and what is liberation theology? Sorry. What is liberation? I was going to say, <laughs> and brings us one step closer in history to the coming of Christ. Yes. Um, we need to be careful that we don't just look at the Old Testament and see images and symbols. We see real mm-hmm. history moving us forward toward God's goal of bringing his son into the world. Yeah. Liberation theology is with us in a number of new incarnations that are in our streets of late. Uh, It's good Hegelianism. It's Marxianism. It's the attempt to take two facets of society, get them mad at each other, throw them together, and produce something in line with your agenda on the other side. This is what Marxism has always done. What made liberation theology a little special when it came into existence in in the 60s was that it used Christian language. Now, that's not wholly new with Marxism and communism. Communism always co-opted the language of the gospel. Liberation, justice, peace, the idea of linear history moving toward a greater society where everybody will love one another and everyone's needs will be met. All that's rooted in Christianity. Mm-hmm. But in, in Latin America in the 60s and 70s, it became popular for priests most of whom had actually been trained in American or European seminaries, and in fact were Westerners to that extent, they weren't necessarily homegrown, began painting the language of Marxism with Christian Christian language. God is on the side of the poor. God is here to take away from those who would oppress you and to, to liberate you. And when you're done, it sounds great if you don't listen too closely. And when you stop comparing it with God's law, but what it came down to, and one proponent basically expressed it this way. If you have more money than everybody else, you obviously got that by oppressing them. So mm-hmm. we need to take all of that away from you, send you packing, and there you go. That's liberation. Isn't it great? Hmm. hard to distinguish that from old-fashioned communism or uh, basically the mafia moving in on you. But because it's done in the name of Jesus and because there are so many Christian images and metaphors piled into it, a lot of people thought, well, this is just good Christianity. Finally, Christianity is getting serious about helping the poor. And it was not uncommon in this movement to grab the exodus which is uh, within redemptive history, the great point of liberation, and co-opt that, as you said, as the paradigm for liberation, Marxist socialist liberation everywhere. Oh, that we could all be like what God did there, where God knocked down the ruling powers, took their stuff, and freed his people. Wait a second. His people. Hmm. Yeah, they actually tended to say things like freed it and oppressed people, freed Mm. a poor people. Mm -hmm. And what we want to talk about tonight is is what the Exodus actually was in terms of God's plan, Mm -hmm. in terms of redemptive history. Uh, We need to swipe it back from them, slap their hands and say, no, you may have your agendas, but you may not borrow from us to promote them. You may not borrow from Jesus to promote theft and violence and terrorism in his name. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Exodus, which everyone knows about because we've all seen the Hollywood pictures, right? (laughs) Which obviously exists in a social vacuum apart from any interpretation by Uh, people influenced by the thing (laughs) we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. We we look at it and we say, oh, that's that's just wonderful. There can be miracles if you believe. (laughs) If Um, you believe. Yeah. Well, let's let's see what it was. When God comes to Moses on the backside of Mount Sinai in the burning bush, 
he announces his intentions to deliver his covenant people. The children of Israel descended both by blood and by covenant from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs to whom God had swore by his own life that he was going to bring the Messiah into the world to be a savior to all peoples, and in thee will all the families of the earth be blessed. And more than that, God had given Abraham a, something of a timeline. You're going to be persecuted by a foreign power for about 400 years, and you're going to go into slavery there, and in the fourth generation, you're going to come out again. I'm going to judge that nation, bring you into the land uh, of the Amorites, the land of Canaan, and give you that land because the earth is mine, and I can do that. And the, the issue here is not Israel's economic, socioeconomic status. The issue is her covenantal status. God, out of sheer grace, has covenanted with a people who weren't the nicest people in the world. And by the time we're done, we're going to see that. These were wonderful, cuddly people that you just would love to have over for tea. They gave Moses and they gave God a really hard time. And yet God in his eternal faithfulness, will not break his word. He has he sends his, his messenger, his prophet, to deliver them. And we've talked a good deal about Moses uh, in the last couple of broadcasts, podcasts. And so <laughs> as we, we look at this, we should consider how he comes before Pharaoh. First, he comes in the name of Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Israel, the God of our fathers, the God of the Hebrews. Pharaoh's really cool. I don't know this God, Yahweh, neither will I let Israel go. It's probably not true. He probably had heard of Yahweh, but he didn't want to acknowledge his existence, any claim from him. He probably also knew exactly who Moses was. Uh, he was a former prince of Egypt from another royal dynasty. Uh, and so it, he's thinking religiously to be sure, because religion is his life and soul, as well as the foundation of his political power. He's also thinking, and therefore he's thinking politically. If I acknowledge the existence of uh, this God of theirs, then that changes the ground rules for everything. I'm no longer the unique representative of the gods on earth. I'm no longer God walking on earth. So this God thing can't be relevant, and therefore I won't even acknowledge its existence. So Moses, Aaron, go away. So what we have from the beginning is a challenge of two religious worldviews, one based on the transcendent creator, the triune God of Scripture, who covenants with men and makes promises that he has promised by his own life to fulfill. And we have this institutionalized form of continuity of being worship, where man himself is God and is part of all things, but therefore able to control all things with magic. And man can do what man can do. Man can save himself. Man can create the ideal social structure, which of course was Egypt, as Pharaoh. You could ask a common Egyptian, too, and he would agree because he didn't know anything else. And if he got out of line, he'd probably be in a lot of trouble. So these are political systems that are at war, but fundamentally, they're, they're religious systems that are not even merely philosophical systems or worldviews in the broad sense. This is personal commitment either to Yahweh or personal commitment to Pharaoh and the demonic forces that lie behind him. This is where the battles joined. This is not about the oppressed and the oppressors, except secondarily or tertially. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's important to understand. This is not God coming to rescue an oppressed people, a poor people. This is God coming to rescue the people he has chosen for himself, despite any merits or demerits of their own. we got a lot of demerits going on. It reminds me of the blurb that goes around on social media now and then that says, you know, Jesus was a Middle Eastern peasant who upset the religious leaders of his time and was uh, killed unlawfully by the government or something. You know, all of this sort of making Jesus an icon of this other thing that they want to represent. Yeah. 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 yeah he's just he's he's just like our absurdities. <laughs> well, there's some su <laughs> there are some superficial resemblances because man is not original. Man always thinks God's thoughts after him. He thinks them either correctly, his mind is conformed to scripture and, and enlightened by the spirit, or he corrupts them and he makes false gods and false messiahs 
And of course, the best lies are those that are that have the appearance of some kind of truth. So just as like Jesus is really important because he's God and like he's God's <laughs> Messiah that he sent to us. Yes. In the same way, like the story of the Exodus is important because it's the story of God saving his people and setting aside a people for himself and building a house for himself, a house for yeah. his name to uh, borrow a phrase. Yes. And, for, and again, thus prepare the landing pad for his son. His mm -hmm. son is going to come to Canaan. He's going to come to Mount Moriah. You know, from the story of Abraham, we've already learned in the Mount of the Lord, it will be seen. It being God providing himself a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, we, we've got to get, Israel's got to get back there. The right people, the right time, the right place. History and geography have to coincide so that God can save his people. And it's not even these people particularly. We're going to come back to that. Their, their temporal redemption from Egypt is key, but their eternal salvation isn't so much. God does not need these particular souls in order to ensure the coming of Christ, but he does need to move them geographically and politically and nationally from where they are to the next place in, in his scheme. And some of these people will be saved for eternity, and many of them will not enter into God's rest. Again, we'll come back to that. So second thing, then, the command that Moses gives to Pharaoh, or the, the request to plead, depending on how you want to look at it, is, thus says the Lord God, the God of the, the, God of the Hebrews, he backs up a little, the God of the Hebrews has met with us, just, just so there's no lack of clarity about who we're talking about. <laughs> Ham, you, you remember, remember Joseph, his God, yeah. Uh, and he wants us to go three days into the wilderness, and there... Worship him, hold a religious festival, a feast. The, the request is never, let us go from slavery. Mm -hmm. Now, that's implied, and Pharaoh knows it's implied, <laughs> because the moment some other god can tell him what to do with this people, then this people obviously must belong to that other god. He's lost possession, he's lost control, he's lost any say. And he can only guess what's going to happen from there. I mean, them leaving would be one of the best of the alternatives. This God could order them all to turn on him and kill him. He, he, will, he would have an enemy people, people loyal to another God within his own borders. Nothing, nothing works here for Pharaoh. Once you recognize that, that people have a higher calling to serve a different God, and you give into that, you have to be ready for all of the possibilities in their political, sociological, economic, and military. And Pharaoh was not going to do that. He is not going to acknowledge an ultimate authority other than himself. And so again and again, as Moses comes and says, "Let my God says, let my people go that they may serve me, that they may worship me, Pharaoh continually resists. And when he begins to slip a little, there are always compromises. All right, worship your God, but worship on my terms. Stay in the land. Okay, well, worship, but um, don't uh, don't take the men. Only take the men. Don't take leave your women and children behind. Don't bring them under the uh, the scope of your God's role. Okay, so your family's going, but leave all your stuff. We get control of your stuff. One by one, he makes concessions as Israel as uh, Egypt is falling down around him. Because he knows that once he says, go, it's all over. It's game, set, match. And his last fleeting attempt to send out the army to try to grab them in the face of everything he's seen is sheer insanity. But, you know, there's, there comes a time when insanity is a pretty good move. When it's the only cards you've got left to play, why not? Go be a psychopath and get everybody killed. Uh, but from Israel's point of view, God is saying, uh, you're mine and you being mine means you're going to worship me. The, your worship of me is the thing that marks our relationship. And so God's not just freeing Israel so they can be free. <laughs> he's freeing them for worship or for service. That is for obedience. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's already told Moses that when they're free, they're going to go to Mount Sinai and he's going to give them further instructions. He's going to give the law at Sinai. And so this, again, over against liberation theology, it's not freedom for freedom's sake. It's not freedom so that you can go and do your own thing and find your own way and rebuild your own society. The exodus was to free God's covenant people 
for worship on God's terms and obedience to him in all of life in terms of God's law. So there, there are no similarities here. Last time we also talked about the Exodus as a war on Egypt's gods. I don't want to repeat all of that. But both as the Egyptians conceived of them, nature spirits who controlled this sphere, or that sphere, the river, the land, the multiplication, frogs and such. God snatched that all away. But on the, on the secondary level, and a far more important one, ultimately, the demonic forces that, that empowered the magicians, God plucked that right out of their hands. The, he completely left the Egyptians disillusioned with their religious faith. Uh, this, this is very much a religious event in the highest sense of the word. He's not simply after the money and the property of the Egyptians. He's after their religious faith. And while many end in, in disillusionment, many are converted and recognize the God of Israel as the true creator God, and they leave with, with mm -hmm. Israel. So it's, it's also evangelism, evangelism through judgment, something we don't talk about a whole lot anymore. Now, it is true that God also destroyed Egypt. We can, again, we go down the line. He destroyed the crops, the, the cattle. He had the Egyptians or the Israelites confiscate all their treasures and jewels and, and gold and such, poison the drinking water, and in the end destroys their army, the heir to the throne, their pharaoh, and at least one male in every household. That's not even counting all the other people who died as, as collateral damage. He leveled Egypt. And though he did pay Israel for her years of bondage, the labor is worthy of his hire, he does not leave Israel there to say, well, got rid of your overlords, got rid of your oppressors, now go enjoy pillage, plunder, have a grand old time in Egypt, it's all yours, I'll check in with you later. Or rebuild it or redeem it. <laughs> yeah, it's this, this, is, this is waste, this is gone, we're going elsewhere, this is not your future. But before that last move, comes the death of the firstborn, the last of the plagues. And here, God's judgment stood not only over Egypt, but stood over his covenant people too. He would not take them with him into freedom unless they were covered by the blood of the lamb. They had to kill a lamb, one for each household. They had to roast it. They had to eat it with unleavened bread and to eat it quickly with their shoes on their feet and their staff in their hand as one's ready to take off and leave. But before all that, they had to take the blood of that lamb and they had to splash it on the sides of the doors and the, the lintel above and place themselves by conscious covenant. Here, here it wasn't enough. We're circumcised. Yeah, you are. Your father's believed. Your father circumcised you. Where's your faith? Time to show it. Time to lay your hands on the lamb and to go hand in hand with the lamb into the promised land. And only those who were marked by the blood of the lamb, who by household, household by household, came under that blood, were free from that final judgment as the angel came through, destroying the firstborn in every household. And, and here, even Egyptians could join in. If the Egyptians wanted to splash the blood of a lamb on their household, they too could be saved. And apparently some were. And so as we, as we look at this, this whole thing, again, as you said to me at the beginning, this is an incredible picture of what God would do 1,500 years later in the person of his son. Because Jesus entered Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan, or of this, this first of the month, this first month of the new ordering of months, uh, the day that the, um, the Passover lambs were selected to be scrutinized, to be to be watched, to, to be sure they were without blemish, without fault. And then on the 14th, when the Passover lambs were being sacrificed, our Savior went to the cross. He went to the cross as the sacrifices began with the morning sacrifice. He gave up his life as the sacrifices ended. And he gave his blood as atonement, propitiation, redemption from sin. So all of this for a start. But Jesus didn't stay dead. He came back from the dead. He rose again. And so he, his whole life was an exodus. When Jesus stood on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, Luke tells us that he spoke of the, the deceit, the, I forget the English word, the Greek word is exodon, the exodus, which he should accomplish in Jerusalem. 
His death and resurrection were the true, the true exodus, the true fulfillment of this, because he takes with, he, he, he's our covenant representative, and he takes with him in his death and resurrection us as well. And so this is all patterned out for us. Uh, Jesus' whole life and ministry, his incarnation through his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the giving of his spirit, and his current reign, are God judging the world, judging modern Egypt, and rescuing his people, people by covenant, people who put their faith in the blood of the Lamb. This is not the gospel that liberation theology preaches, but it is the gospel that's here. And again, it's not merely a pattern for the gospel or symbols of the gospel. But if these things historically had not happened, if Israel had stayed in Egypt, there'd be no people in Canaan to greet Messiah and to work out the story of redemption that God had planned. Mm -hmm. it's I'm the pausing. Means, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> it's the, the means by which God accomplished that greater salvation. Um, he's... God keeps doing this in the Bible. As I'm reading through it this this year, as I mentioned, I've fallen woefully behind. I'm trying to catch up in my Bible in a year plan. <laughs> but there's just this time after time, God is accomplishing his purposes in ways that tell you what that purpose is going to be. And it's just, I think you've said it before, it's the greatest mystery novel, except that it's true. It's It's really wonderful. Uh, coming back to something I kept hinting at, this generation, they, they left Egypt in the Exodus, baptized in, in the divided waters, fed by God with bread from heaven, heavenly bread. They go water out of the rock. They go to Mount Sinai. They're given the law of God. God sets up his home in their midst, the tabernacle. He comes and descends and lives in their midst and walks with them and takes them to Canaan. Perfect ending of the story. Except that's not how the story ends because they get to Canaan <laughs> and then they say, giants, uh, we're not going in there. You're trying to get us killed. I know. Let's go back to Egypt. That'd be so great. We never we had we had garlic and onions and leeks in Egypt. <laughs> yeah, that's a reason to go back to being slaves. Look, and garlic and onions are great, but <laughs> I'm not sure about the. Do leak you know the song by Keith Green? Oh yeah, so you want to go back yes. to Egypt? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Now I can't remember what I was going to say. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the writer of Hebrews spends some time with this in Hebrews uh, three and four where he points out that this generation had the gospel preached to them. But the, the gospel that was preached in all of these figures and types, and by the clear words of the promise that God had made to Abraham, it did not work faith in their hearts. It was not received in faith. It was not mixed with faith in the hearts of those who heard. And, and so they were barred from God's rest. When they said, we're not going in, God said, fine, you're not. Mm -hmm. And they thought for a second and said, wait, Wait, we definitely want to go in. We, we we'll, want to go we'll in obey now. now. We'll, we'll, we'll obey. We'll go in. No, you won't. Yeah, we will. Watch us. Uh, you're checking out by it. And the Canaanites stomped on them, and they came back out, bloodied and with a lot of dead. And God said, now, where we were, where were you? Oh, yes. For your spies were there for 40 days. That earns you 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. While the younger generation grows up, the younger generation endures boot camp in the wilderness for 40 years. So the kids that were, you know, 18, 19, 20, 40 years later, they're 58, 59, 60, and they're finally ready for the next step. But that whole generation, the writer of Hebrews says, their carcasses fell in the wilderness. They did not enter into God's rest, with a very few exceptions. Aside from Moses, the two we know about, well, Aaron and Miriam, we can assume. And beyond that, we've got Joshua and Caleb, the two faithful spies. It may be that there were others, but the, the writer of Hebrews is not terribly hope, hopeful on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the message seems to be that that entire generation that was liberated was only liberated outwardly. Mm -hmm. They were not saved from their sins. And so when they met a challenge of giants and cities walled up to heaven, they weren't ready for the battle. And they thought 
in terms of Egypt. Let's go back where someone else can take care of us and meet our needs, and we don't have to. We don't have to be responsible people of faith. The government can solve our problems. And if we want to bring that back to uh, liberation theology, be because they focus so much on liberation from Egypt in, in worldly political terms, uh, completely divorced from the spiritual, it's it's kind of odd that they would focus on that, given that if they got their way and they were allowed to foment some kind of revolution that resulted in a, a political exodus in the modern the modern era, the end result of that allegory is that they're going to die in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think that Emily has pointed this out, or somebody's pointed it out lately, maybe someone in our Bible study, now that I think about it. We don't know the Bible very well. Mm. American Christians do not know the Bible very well. We know it as a, something like a series of Aesop's fables or fairy tales from the Brothers Grimm. It's, it's, it's always kind of cute when Hollywood or it's usually Hollywood starts grabbing the various fairy tales and throwing them into the same universe. <laughs> and we're all pleased with the continuity. Oh, you mean Snow White actually knows Cinderella? That's kind of cute. I like that. <laughs> um, but that's, that's, I think, it probably is a reflection of, of Christian thinking. Uh, we 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 want the continuity. We want the single universe, morally for certain. Mm -hmm. uh, every story a Christian tells should exist in God's universe in the sense that God's law is binding and that human beings are human beings, sinners in need of a savior. But when all the stories start coalescing, then it reminds us of something. But unfortunately, we, it doesn't remind us of the Bible enough because we look at the Bible and it's still... Well, there's this story and there's that story, and the average Sunday school child cannot tell you how one story leads into another, can't put them together as history, and there's an awful lot they plain don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that probably a lot of Sunday school kids would know, they, they would know the story of Israel not entering the promised land because they will be reminded of Joshua and Caleb, the two faithful spies. Yeah. I think that story sticks. Mm -hmm. And they would know the Exodus to some degree. I don't think that they bridge the stories, though. These people that God rescued, they're the ones who get lost in the wilderness and die of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Do we really make that part of the story clear, or are we just throwing up blurbs of Christian fairy tale without following the history and seeing the spiritual covenantal cause and effect that ripples all the way through. Mm. Uh, I, I, I think not. I think that may be the answer, Brian. We're really good at just grabbing images and yeah. waving them around. Because even, even just terms like yeah. we in yeah. both stories we we hear, you know, God rescued Israel from Egypt. And then we also hear Israel entered the promised land. And it's like we're forgetting that these are two different Israels that are happening in time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's covenantally, they're the same people over history. But in terms of individuals, uh, they certainly aren't. A yeah. whole generation has passed. Yeah, and, and then that theme gets picked up when when it says, uh, not all who are of Israel are of Israel. Not all Israel are of Israel. So there's, there's, there's a lot to be said for covenantal thinking at this point. Mm -hmm. And covenantal thinking is necessarily historical thinking. The more we understand the Bible as a covenantal book, the more we will stress the historical continuity of God's redemptive acts within our history, within our timeline, within our geography. And, and we will not be misled by people waving banners that say justice and freedom and liberty, equality and such things, love, acceptance, mm -hmm. approval. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. <laughs> uh, or morte, or death was the other part that no one ever quotes in that little slogan. <laughs> so they were very serious. You're going to love me or I'm going to kill you. We're talking about the French Revolution, in case anyone missed that one. And, and with that in mind, let, let me bring this down to um, very contemporary relevance. We're not so enmeshed in Latin America as we were in the 60s. And problems that were once those of other countries are now not only in our streets, but at our front door. And the, the kind of thinking is still very much the same. Let's create a conflict 
uh, we will the the oppressors are easy to find they're the ones who coincidentally are the heirs of christian civilization whether or not they are faithful in that is something else again just as god's people in egypt weren't exactly faithful they were worshiping idols and the first three plagues hit them too and then later the whole generation apostatized so just because you're the heirs of a great tradition doesn't mean anything for you personally, except greater responsibility. But still, as Pharaoh recognized, this, these people who have this relation with this creator God that we don't want to talk about, they're the threat. And so here's the target. Here's your oppressor class. Here's people who have stuff. They have money. They have position. They have privilege. Well, let's find people we can we can make into their enemies. I'm I'm going to recommend an article on uh, Herbert Marcuse later. Marcuse was in the '60s, was uh, he was uh, he served in the University of California system until Ronald Reagan fired him or got him fired. But he was the one who began to see the possibilities in finding new yangs for yangs, new dark sides for light sides. Let's. Let's try the young alienated students who are afraid of fighting in war. Let's try blacks who already have agreements. Let's try women who right now simply want equality of pay. What can we do with that? And he began basically charting out the future of the century that would follow, saying, here are our target groups. Let's get them to think of themselves as the oppressed. Mm. And... Let's start throwing them with the oppressors. And then let's make the oppressors feel very bad that they're the oppressors. Let's guilt trip them so they surrender. Let's take away any sense, any, any proper pride of identity, any proper thankfulness for the gifts God has given them. And let them just throw up their hands and turn it all over. And then we can rewrite the social structures, which has been the goal of socialism from the beginning, from the French Revolution and before. Well, this is something that we'll come back and talk about a lot, I should think, over the next mm -hmm. weeks and months. Yeah. Final thoughts before we switch to recos? I can't decide which of the two things I have left here I want to recommend, so I'm probably going to recommend both of them. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to recommend is uh, a series of videos on YouTube, which are lectures by the fantasy author Brandon Sanderson. And he is giving mm -hmm. lectures on writing. And Brandon Sanderson is one of my favorite contemporary authors. He is a Mormon, which means he's very good at writing fantasy worlds. And <laughs> oh, I saw that coming. I still didn't believe it when you said it. All right, go on. <laughs> <laughs> but he is, just wait actually, till we talk about Scientology. <laughs> oh, geez. But he's he is very a very talented writer. He's very good at writing uh, character development characters. He's really good at coming up with unique characters as well. And also uh, his action narrative is second to very few and none that I can think of off the top of my head. Mm. Um, we'll include a link to the playlist of those in the show notes, I imagine. And mm -hmm. the second thing I want to recommend is a Mark Twain essay, which I discovered last week or the week before that... I don't think I've laughed quite so hard in many, many months because it's called <clears throat> The Awful German Language. <laughs> and I am a gigantic fan of German. I studied it right out of high school and initially had dreams of studying at university in Germany, which uh, probably somewhat for better did not come uh, come to pass. But it, it's filled with your your standard Twain witticisms and uh, mockery, uh, including a a very humorous line where he he talks about how the word Z means her, she, they, them, it, its, hers, and his, um, and and he says, imagine the sheer poverty of a language that would force a a single word to pull. Uh, nine times duty compared to other words, and a, a, a wee little thing of three letters uh, at that. Uh, that's why whenever uh, someone I do not know approaches me on the street and says Z to me, I try to fight him if a stranger. 
<laughs> so I recommend that. Oh, it's wow. if you know any German, uh, even if you don't know any German, you, you'll probably find some humor in it. But if you That's know a, German, there's a lot more to laugh at. <laughs> it's oddly prescient too with our kerfuffle around pronouns these days. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Just say Z, it covers every base. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I wonder, I too will now recommend two things because your German thing just reminded me of something else I stumbled across today. But first, by Denise, Denise D'Souza, who probably isn't in favor right now, but I don't care. <laughs> He's um, rarely in favor, but we like him anyway. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he wrote an article called The Philosopher of Antifa, or Antifa, I'm not sure how to say the word. And it is an explanation of the uh, influence of Herbert Marcuse in the 60s. What I said earlier, I largely pulled from this article. I learned a lot from this, and I think it's worth your time just to understand why things are happening the way they are and, and why it, it, it just kind of congealed overnight, it seems. It's been in the making for a long time. And there comes a point where when everything's set, you know, you throw your first thing, it doesn't work. Your second thing's right in the wings, ready to come. And your third thing, because the basic presuppositions, the Hegelian idea of, of, of antithesis into synthesis is there. Find your black and white, throw them together, make the gray, push the agenda forward. That that black didn't work? Well, let's find another black or let's do some green and yellow. Or let's, do, let's just keep throwing them, keep everybody off balance. And eventually, we'll get what we wanted all along, which is the destruction of Christian civilization, because, well, it's just yucky and we hate it. On another front, oddly enough, from another enemy of the faith, but an intelligent one, George Orwell, I, I found this, um, something my daughter Emily sent me a long time ago. It's uh, Orwell on politics and the English language. Brian, you kind of perked up. You remember this one? I actually just had someone link me to this essay today. Oh, that's <laughs> weird. Politics and English language, 1946. Orwell starts by giving, whoa, I just lost my screen, uh, by giving what, five, five just random quotes, one from uh, a book called Politics, another in Degossi, another comp uh, a communist pamphlet, another uh, letter to the Tribune. And, and he just sets it down here. Well, let, me, let me just read you an arbitrary one. Above all, we cannot play ducks and drakes with a native battery of idioms which prescribes egregious collocations of vocables as the basic put up with for tolerate or put up a loss for bewilder. Yeah, your, your response should be, <laughs> what was that? He's trying to tell you to speak simply. He failed. Anyway, and so <laughs> Orwell goes through very quickly and very simply uh, a philosophy of pairing English down to simple words that people can understand and that will make you stop sounding like a pompous ass. So it's it's fun. <laughs> and I, I following Brian's lead, I recommend Politics and the English Language by George Orwell. All right. Uh, my recommendation is a movie with Steve Martin called A Simple Twist of Fate. Uh, it is a retelling of the story of Silas Marner, mm. uh, which I think I read an abridged version of in high school. Um, I think David read the actual book or something more like it. Um, and he, he really enjoyed that story. Um, I think it was a family favorite. And my dad has liked this movie for a long time. So we watched it this week and it just hit the spot. You know, it was light enough that it is a, a welcome escape from a lot of the troubles that we're all <laughs> dealing with right now. But true enough to life that there is sadness and redemption and just just good, good stuff. Good stuff in this movie. So does Steve Martin not play himself? Steve Martin, <laughs> I think he does it. He actually acts in this one. Oh, that's, that's I think. good. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy Steve Martin most of all in his appearance on The Muppet Show. Well, that, that's, that's <laughs> definitely one. <laughs> kind of like Alice Cooper in that respect. Yeah, yes. Uh, Have you ever seen him in The Spanish Prisoner? No. Mm -mm. I recommend that. Okay. And I will not tell you why. He plays... 
he, he it's a serious uh, mystery crime period piece, and I think you might enjoy it if you're ready for surprise endings that may or may not please. <laughs> Anyway, right. there we go. We have a lot Hang of Hang on, you all got two recommendations each. Oh, okay. <laughs> Come right. on, play Be that way. All right, my second recommendation is another movie that we watched this past week. We were house sitting for my parents down in rural Virginia, um, and we watched Holes, which oh, is an yes. excellent yes. adaptation of an excellent children's book. Young adult fiction, I'd say. It's not quite a children's book. Um, but that deals with a lot of heavy issues oh, yeah, and does, does so in a really spectacularly good storytelling setting. Mm -hmm. So simple to twist of fate and holes. Two recommendations for me. Hmm? What I've always loved is um, the fact that children's stories can touch on true things so much more than adult movies because adult movies are so so pretentious yes. uh, yeah. about themselves <laughs> yeah. um even even ones that are just like sheer entertainment like they they just take themselves so so seriously at it mm -hmm. there's no there's very rare moments of whimsy in adult yeah comedy they're also really unwilling to commit like there's always this cynicism or self-awareness that like huh isn't that funny we thought it was funny too because like it's not like we really cared about this story or anything we wouldn't be that dweeby <laughs> i mean what nerd sits around and writes the script of a movie not me definitely no so yeah they all they're they're too self-occupied with winking at the camera yeah yeah that's my well, we've just painted with the broadest take. brush ever <laughs> so we clearly don't like any movies except for kids movies correct kids books. yes <laughs> Well, with that, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I look forward to picking it up with you guys next week. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our listeners. If you want to jump in on this conversation, send us questions, comments, insults. Maybe light on the insults. Just kidding. Send us your insults at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. I don't read the emails. David reads the emails. That's why I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Say good night, everybody. All right. Good night. <laughs> See you next week. Final thoughts before we switch to Recos? Going no. once, <laughs> going twice. Well, there were the two things I was told to say, but I, I don't know that they're quite... <laughs> I don't know if they're relevant anymore. There was never a touch yeah. point for them, and it feels yeah. awkward to just shoehorn them in. So. <laughs> They'll come after the closing music. <laughs> <laughs> just randomly. Romans 9 is about nations. <laughs>